My name is Liz. I am so pleased to be here today. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Um, I want to welcome you all to the Sustainability Laboratories Conversation Series. This is our 19th conversation of the series that was launched in 2021 to explore global systemic approaches to challenge of sustainability with the leading edge thinkers of our time. An archive of these conversations can be found on the lab's website. Today, it is my absolute privilege to introduce you to Vandana Shiva. She's a world-renowned environmental thinker, activist, feminist, philosopher of science, writer, and science policy advocate. She's the founder of the Research Foundation for Science, Technology, and Ecology, Navdanya and Bija Vidyapith, Earth University in Uttarakhand, India. She's also the recipient of many awards, including the Right Livelihood Award and the Sydney Peace Prize. Vandana Shiva has been named among the top five most important people in Asia by Asia Week. She's a prolific writer and author of numerous books. And there's just so much more that I could tell you about her. Um, but I'll stop here by saying how thrilled and honored we are to be speaking with Vandana Shiva. Uh, I'm going to give the floor over to the Sustainability Lab's founding director, uh, Dr. Michael Benelli, uh, to continue the conversation. Thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being with us. And wonderful, wonderful to have you, Vandana. It's, it's a real, we're all very excited for that event. And thank you for taking it. It's such a late hour in your part of uh, the world. Uh, after this introduction from Liz, uh, perhaps we can return to you for and ask you to do a more personal uh, introduction of yourself. Uh, yeah, you know, like the, the making of Vandana Shiva. Uh, if you can tell us a little bit about growing up, the milestone in your early development, important inspirations, important influences, events, teachers, mentors, and the like. And thank you again for being here. Thank you. Um... Yeah, I, I grew up in the Himalaya, in the forest. My father, who had been served in the British Army, uh, moved into the Forest Conservation Service. And my mother, who had been an um, education officer in U United India, uh, became a refugee <clears throat> when a line was drawn to defy, to create Pakistan and se it separated from India. So as a refugee, she just decided she had, you know, broken all the glass ceilings and now she wanted to be a farmer. So she chose to be a farmer. My father was in the forest. That's the environment I grew up in. Uh, and my education was nature itself, but also these little libraries in these little wood huts, which were rest houses in the forest. We travel with our dad, often on foot, sometimes on horseback, very rarely by motorized vehicle because there were very few roads in my childhood. Grew up with animals, grew up with the richest forests we could imagine. And it's the disappearance of a forest that made me realize that we can seriously harm nature. And uh, I looked then for the, uh, you know, the movement called Chipko, um, and this is just before I was leaving for Canada to do a PhD. Now, how from a forest do I want to do physics? How, why did I choose physics? Because I read a tiny little book by Einstein in one of these rest houses. And it was on science and uh, responsibility, social responsibility. And I said, this is the kind of person I want to be. Yeah. So I went to schools that didn't have physics, but I then changed schools. And uh, I taught myself, went to University professor sought them out after school. Uh, my parents were had been part of the freedom movement and continued to be the commons for every activist wherever my father was posted. So Gandhi's disciples would come and stay with us, Mira Behan, Sarla Behan, the Chipko leaders themselves. And uh, so we grew up realizing that we have to share what we have with others. And uh, we grew up realizing that we are part of the earth. Um, that's what's shaped. And my, my, our parents' own life of freedom and simplicity uh, shaped our values. That's, 
Now, you, you, you have studied physics and actually started your career as a nuclear physicist. So what prompted the change to uh, the environment and ecology? Well, <clears throat> I, I chose physics. I was chosen uh, for a science talent scholarship when I was leaving school. And it was given to a handful of students. And we were sent for special trainings during summer for summer schools. Um, and I was sent for training to the Baba Atomic Research Center for two summers. <laughs> and I was in the experimental fast breeder reactor when it was going critical. And that was exciting. And I came home and uh, was sharing my excitement. And my sister, who was in the medical school, just asked me a simple question about radiation and health. And they didn't teach us that. They teach us, taught us about you know, chain reactions and energy transitions, but not about radiation and its harm to health. And I said, I don't want a one night science. I'm, I want to study science to understand the whole. And so I said, I'll shift to theoretical physics. And that's how I ended up uh, specializing in particle physics and then going on to do a PhD in quantum theory. You worked for a while on a nuclear reactor. Was it in Canada? Or... No, no, it was a Canadian reactor in uh, in India. It was the okay. called Kandu, the Canadian reactor in the Bhabha Atomic Research Center. Now, I, I was wondering whether there are any key concepts from quantum physics that informed your own approach and understanding of environmental issues. Are there some actual? Yes. Let's hear about them. Very, very, very much. I think the first element of quantum thinking, as opposed to mechanical thinking, is uh, that uh, everything is connected. You know, uh, the idea of immutable particles all separate from each other is a very mechanical idea. And my thesis was on non-locality in quantum theory. Uh, and non-locality means non-separation. You cannot tear apart that which is connected. Uh, the second very, very powerful concept that has informed all of my work uh, for social justice as well as for ecology is there are no things in the universe, no fixed inanimate things in the universe. There is a constantly unfolding potential. And the unfolding pot potential is, of course, shaped by the context. Uh, so in the quantum world, the context then allows either the wave to emerge or the particle to emerge. And the potential for both is in the same quanta. Uh, when I did my big study on the Green Revolution in 1984, which is what made me then commit my life to agriculture, is that when Punjab erupted in violence, and I'd done my MSc honors in particle physics, and my university just honored me uh, <laughs> as an illustrious alumni in, my, in the 50th year of graduation. Uh, I said the Punjab I studied in was peaceful. Uh, and 84, 10 years later, it is erupting in violence. What changed? And, uh, and the and I started to look for the potential of violence and the potential for peace and started to look at the context. Uh, so I've carried that understanding to all of my work in ecological issues. Uncertainty and indeterminateness. That is why all of the, the language today of precision, knowing exactly, predicting, to the ultimate detail mm. is, is not just arrogance, it's totally unscientific, actually, in a world of indeterminism. And then because, you know, the same thing can be a wave and a particle, this potential is constantly there. For you to talk about you're either with us or against us, you know, mm. you're either a friend or an enemy, and constant 
putting things in boxes of the excluded middle, which is at the root of all the hate and violence we witnessed today. So these are principles that, you know, uh, that got refined in my quantum training and have got further refined in my ecological activism because at the end of the day, the languages of description are different, but the principles in ecology and quantum world are the same. Uh, this is wonderful. I, I, I like this uh, notion of the universe as an unfolding potential uh, rather than a static thing of objects just floating around. But you, you know, to go uh, to catch on what you're saying, your basic mindsets and views of the world obviously affect uh, reality, the, 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 the reality that we shape. And you've been highlighting the difference between the currently predominant uh, mechanistic view uh, of the world and a more holistic understanding of reality. Uh, how would you characterize the essence of the difference between the two? Without going into actual examples, we will see how the impact of this mindset uh, impacts the trade and economy and so forth, but a little later. We just want to grasp the what is the basic difference and the importance of that difference. I think the first difference is separation versus interconnectedness. And the second big difference is linked to the whole issue of interconnectedness, that you, because things are interconnected, acting on one part impacts the rest. Yeah. And that can be for an organism, it can be for a community, it can be for an ecosystem, uh, it, it can be for society. Another very, very big difference is in a divided world, in a world of separation, what you have is linear causality. You know, one thing impacts one other thing. There's a line that connects causality. But in an interconnected complex world, in a quantum world, what you have is systems causality and contextual causality. Mm. Systems causality means you it's the system itself that's having an impact. And that's why constantly looking, in, in not just in mechanical ways, but in reductionist ways, dividing a whole into its parts and with arrogance, putting one part as the master. Uh, you said don't use examples, but I will just mention that the reductionist view of living systems allowed a paradigm to emerge that there's a master molecule in living systems. Uh, and in living systems, everything's working together in concert. In, in a way, there's a democracy at play at every step within organisms, within communities. Whereas you, the mechanical reductionist mindset is always looking for mastery, mastery over the natural world mastery in terms of the molecules, mastery of a class. Um, and, and both, you know, there's no way you can divide how society imagines itself and how it shapes the imagination of nature. Yeah, you, you, you'll be very happy to, to learn that at the lab, we put system thinking and a holistic approach at the heart of everything uh, that we do. So uh, plurality and interactions uh, is of the essence. And in fact, the system sciences teach us that the long viability of complex system depends precisely on their internal complexity, on their internal variety. So can you share, and in fact, what we're doing, uh, it seems to be monoculturing the planet. <laughs> Uh, both in terms of the social aspects of it, the, the uh, economic, and of course, how we deal with nature. So can you share your view about the critical importance of diversity at, at all levels? Well, of course, my view of diversity uh, is the view that shaped my growing up in forests. Forests are always diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, no natural system creates monocultures of eucalyptus or pine. It doesn't create monocultures of consumption. It doesn't create monocultures of, uh, of crops. Um, and so quite early, 
in my life, I wrote the book Monocultures of the Mind because I said, here's this rich forest and they can't see it. <laughs> And what's the blinding? You know, the blinding is that in their mind, they've shaped the monoculture. They've shaped the monoculture because the market reduces a complex, diverse world into a commodity that has to be exploited. And so even though there's a rich forest out there, all you see is the one species that you can cut and sell. And I remember when I was doing the work on forestry, there was actually articles that came out and said, you know, in, in terms of uh, of economic benefits, a rainforest is actually only full of weeds. <laughs> because maybe there's one mahogany that you can exploit in it. And the same then I realized, you know, it's in my lifetime, um, the Green Revolution was introduced and I washed Punjab, changed from a rich, diverse agriculture to monocultures of rice and wheat. And the whole world from 10,000 species of plants that we used to eat around the world over history to about 10 globally traded commodities. Because that's, you know, it's the look for the market. It's the look from trade. It's not from uh, the system. Let, let's follow up that thinking. The, uh, the Green Revolution in particular, uh, uh, when it was launched, it was the Green Revolution was held as a great promise for leading the world, uh, uh, feeding the world. Um, where, where did it go wrong? Well, I think it went wrong in being a post-truth narrative, even at that time. <laughs> you know, people thought it was a good idea. It went wrong later. It was a bad idea. And it was full of double speak. Begin with the term green. Was it called green because it was going to be ecological? No, it was called green because it was not red. Because next to us, a red revolution was taking place. And the idea was somehow to both sell the extra war chemicals, synthetic fertilizers, as well as create the commercial track, you know, so people wouldn't learn towards the communist path, you know, as in China, the Red Revolution was taking place, so they said, okay, call, call it green. This is before there were green parties, before there was green politics. Uh, the main agenda was selling chemicals, selling fertilizers. Norman Borlaug, who got the Nobel Peace Prize, he even said, he says, you know, fertilizers, that's the key. The plant had to change for the fertilizer. And his work was really to change the plant in order to for the plants to withstand the chemical fertilizers because all traditional breeding by farmers has been to maximize photosynthesis, to maximize biodiversity, to maximize uh, the ability of an ecosystem to provide for all needs, for all species, not just for human beings. So for example, the tall varieties of rice or the tall varieties of wheat that you know, for we save in our movement, um, the they give straw, which is food for the soil organisms. It is food for the animals. And the grain is food for humans. But uh, when reduced to a commodity and fed with chemical fertilizers, which is not a natural diet for the plant, the tall plants lodge. So the tall plants were shrunk and the dwarf varieties basically bred with stolen norin wheat from Japan and Dejan Dewanju for Indonesia. These dwarf varieties could then withstand the fertilizers. But now the animals couldn't eat it because it was not edible straw. It was thick like a stick. And, and the grain went now increasingly to animal feed. If you do research today, 70 to 80 percent of most of the grain being produced in the world is going for animal feed. Animals didn't eat the grain. You didn't eat the grain. We ate the grain. They ate the straw. We deprived them of straw and we they created a deprivation for humans. But this chemical package required more water. It requires 10 times more water. More, more log has admitted it. And so wherever the Green Revolution is introduced, you have a water famine. Groundwater dries up, river waters dry up. 
soil is really a living system. And it's the diversity of organisms in the soil that make the fertility, that create the fertility. Chemical fertilizers kill the soil. In my early days when I used to teach farmers, I would show what a urea does to an earthworm. Later when we had microscopes, we could show what soils that are fertilized with synthetic fertilizers, how desertified they are in living organisms. And how in just a few months, soil organisms can build back if you give them the organic food, which is what they need. So, you know, the soil died, started to die immediately. The water started to disappear immediately. Uh, chemically fertilized plants are more vulnerable to pests. Pesticides had to be used. A train started to go from Punjab to Rajasthan called the cancer train. Its name is the cancer train. And the whole idea we fed the world, you see, that's where I started to focus my scientific thinking. I said, my eyes tell me the biodiverse fields of traditional farming are producing more. These monoculture row crops are producing less. And yet they say this is high yielding and produce and a miracle that got rid of hunger. First of all, we never had a famine after independence, after the British were left, left us or we threw them out, whatever way you want to look at it. Um, the, I said, no, this, this is not right. This yield, the measure of yield is a very partial measure. It doesn't measure the soil. It doesn't measure the diversity and the output. Mm. It doesn't measure the state of the farmer. And it doesn't measure the quality of the food. So over time, I've gone through this whole system. What are the soils like? The soils die. We've done scientific studies comparing chemical and organic soils. What is the state of the farmer? We do cost-benefit analysis with farmers. The fact that India has had so many farm protests, particularly in the land of Punjab, is because the Green Revolution is a losing enterprise. And the fact that today in Romania, in Germany, in France, in Netherlands, their farm protests, tractors are on the street everywhere. <laughs> it's because that industrial agriculture is a negative economy for farmers. More is taken from them than they earn. And finally, the quality of food, 70, 80% nutrition gone, toxics that are giving us chronic diseases. So all this was in the design of the Green Revolution. It's just that started, you know, I think my book was the first ecological analysis. Uh, but it was, as an ecological, systemic project, it was wrong from the beginning. And of course, it doesn't even count uh, a, a disasters like the pesticides plant in Bhopal. Uh, absolutely, it was 1984, with the violence of Punjab and the disaster of Bhopal, and then the killing of our Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. That made me sit up and I, I was those days working for a United Nations university program. And I said, I want to study this conflict. There's something going on. And I don't, I mean, I can see the conflict, but I can't see the roots. I can't see the context that goes. So I did the book, both because of Punjab and Bhopal. And one other thing I didn't mention, after all, synthetic nitrogen fertilizers are the single biggest greenhouse gas polluter the nitrous oxide is 300 times more damaging to the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. And this was getting emitted right away. 50% of the climate havoc and pollution is caused by an industrial farming system and food system. Can, can you, uh, you just uh, kind of hinted at the connection between the Monsanto disasters and the assassination of Gandhi. Uh, can you return to that for, for a minute? I think that's a fascinating aspect of it. Monsanto? Uh, sorry, the Bhopal. Oh, no, no, not yeah. Gandhi, Indira Gandhi. Indira yeah. Gandhi. Okay, so basically, you know, Punjab, an, another element of the Green Revolution that is not understood, which I had to go to, I, those were days, there was no Google, there was no, you know, there was no internet, nothing. I had to like, go to actual libraries to read paper. And I read every paper of that time, every policy document of that time. So the Green Revolution was not chosen by India. It was forced on India. In 1965, we'd had a drought. And uh, 
and there was no famine, there was no starvation. But the prices of food started to rise because of the drought. And it started to affect not the people in the villages who were growing their food, but it started to affect the workers who had been taken to these big steel plants, you know, the Bokaro steel plant and the Rorgela steel plant. And because food was going costly, they were running back home and said, at least there's food at home. And so to stabilize the prices, our prime minister of that time, Karl Bahadur Shastri, asked the U.S. to send more wheat under what was called the PL480 scheme, a public law, where we could buy in rupees rather than in dollars. And Johnson said, no, we will not send you wheat. You will take the fertilizers. You change your farming system. And Shastri said, we are such a big country, old civilization. To change agriculture, we will do experiments first. Mm. Let us try it out. But we can, I cannot force the whole country to adopt chemicals without testing it out. And then, in a strange way, dear Shastri died during peace talks in uh, in Tashkent. And then in there, Gandhi took over after a while. And when the Punjab violence erupted, that particular 84, in May, the farmers had blockaded the governor's residence. And they had announced by 4th of June, they were going to blockade the supply of grain. They said, we are living under slavery. We can't decide what we'll grow, how we'll grow it. We can't decide when the waters of our own rivers will reach our fields. We can't decide what price we will sell, what we've grown at, or where mm. we will sell it. This is slavery. And they said, we are going to stop the supply so that we are made free again. And the 4th of June was the day they announced of blockading the grain supply. It literally a grain strike. I mean, if the farmers of the world were to do that today, then people will realize how important their production is. And I don't think it was Indira Gandhi alone, but I think the whole, yeah, and I definitely know the UK intelligence was involved. I don't know about others, but she was told to send the military to the Golden Temple. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's where some of the people who were leaders of fear, inspiring the farmers. They were staying in the Golden Temple, the sacred shrine of the city. And the military was sent. And, you know, it's, it's like for the Catholics sending the army to the Vatican. And uh, the her six security guards assassinated her that day. It, a few days before the Bhopal disaster. So we had three tragedies in a row. And interestingly, it was 1984. All the unintended consequences. Yeah. Let me see. So yeah. you, you've been uh, advocating and practicing a different approach with seeds as the cornerstone of environmental your environmental work. Uh, you, you've been also called uh, the Gandhi of grain. So please tell us more about this part of your work. When, you know, I did the study on the Green Revolution. And then I started to build the movement to promote organic farming. I didn't even call it organic farming then. I just called it nonviolent agriculture. Because I realized that, you know, for me, to, when I study something, and there's a deep problem that's affecting nature and affecting society. I, I can't just do a book and publish it and walk on, you know? Uh, every time it's serious, I have to take it on as my responsibility. Began with the agriculture. And because I'd done the agriculture work, I started to get invited. And in one conference was a conference in 1987 were on the new biotechnologies. There were no GMOs in the world that time. But there was, the tools had been involved in 72 by public scientists, and they had even put a moratorium. They said, we know how to do recombinant DNA, but we don't know what it means. Until we understand the consequences, we will not go further down this road. Mm -hmm. But of course, once, you know, papers had been published and all the venture capital, the big industry, started to pick it up. And at this meeting of 87, the corporations that were there 
which were already very big, but they merged later and became bigger. Siva was separate, Sandoz was separate, uh, Imperial Chemicals were separate, Astra was separate, or oh, they all became one, they became Syngenta. Uh, Monsanto was separate, uh, Bayer was separate. They used to be Mobe during Hitler's time, and they're Mobe again, you know, they've merged again. Uh, but at this meeting, they said three things that really shaped the future of my life. The first thing they said is, we have to do genetic engineering in order to be able to take patents on seed. Because when we do genetic engineering, we can claim we have invented the seed. And I said, but you don't invent a seed by shooting a gene into it, you know? It's like my taking a chair into someone's house and saying, your house is mine, I'm the architect, I'm the landlord, you pay me rents. Uh, and they thought they'd get away with this nonsense of seed as a machine, we are inventors. Second thing they said is we are too small. The giant corporations felt they were too small. And they said, the ones who will merge and the ones who will take patents will be the ones who rule. And we will be five companies by the year 2000, controlling all of food and all of health. I said, what kind of dictatorship do you want? This is bioimperialism. And the third thing they said was, but we can't get there if farmers save seeds. Because if they save seeds, it's free for, for them. Mm -hmm. So we have to make laws that make it illegal for farmers to save seeds. And they talked about the intellectual property laws. They were already working on in the GATT, the General Agreement on Tate of Tariff, which shaped the WTO. That's the first time I heard of the GATT. That's the first time I heard of intellectual property on seed. And so from that day onwards, I started to save seeds, work with my government to write laws, and work with my government to resist the intellectual property regime of WTO. We managed to get clauses changed. In India, we wrote laws that said we don't invent the seed. Seed plants, animals, and seeds are not human inventions. Therefore, they cannot be patented by human. And the third thing was recognizing the farmers have been the breeders. So I worked with my government to write a law on plant varieties and farmers' rights, not just the corporation, corporate, corporate right. And through the seed saving, we've saved more than 100. And we've created 150 community seed banks, saved more than 4,000 varieties of rice, about 250 varieties of wheat, every pulse that was disappearing, oil seeds. And among the seeds we were saving, because we were just saving the seeds, with the basic assumption that nature is not stupid, our ancestors were not stupid. Whatever they evolve, they evolved it for the purpose. And in the seeds we saved were salt tolerant varieties that we could distribute after cyclones when the salt water came from the sea. There were seeds that were drought tolerant. And with climate changes, drought grows. We spread the seeds of millets, which are very drought resistant. And 35 years ago, we started promoting the millets, which were called primitive grains, backward crops in the Green <laughs> Revolution vocabulary. Uh, but the, last year was declared the UN year of, of millets. So here are all you know, the, the claims being made. We can do this only with genetic engineering. So no, the farmers have already done it. You know, you, yours, I mean, I, yours is really a very crude and very violent attempt. And it's not that you're able to Im improve the system. The real trick is by doing whatever you do, you're able to claim property rights on that which is the commons. So, you know, for me, it's always been about the truth of how nature works and the rights of people to the commons and all kinds of attempts to enclose the commons, the land, the sea, the biodiversity, our minds now. Yeah. So you, you, you've been uh, celebrated as a leading uh, eco-feminist and advocated the role of nurturing female energy in growing food. Uh, actually, my own teacher and mentor, Buckman Mr. Fuller, uh, suggested that the, the Neolithic the, the Neolithic revolution was actually led by women who were 
domesticating the first plants and animals while the man was out uh, hunting or marauding other things and so forth. And I saw somewhere you, you quoted Gandhi as kind of thing, make me more female. So tell us about yeah. your, your view about the role of women uh, in, in, can you explore that in agriculture and, and, and in producing food and yeah. all the other stuff? So, you know, my own mother, of course, chose to be a farmer and uh, and created a farm from scratch with yeah. tigers and elephants roaming around her while she lived in a tent. Um, and then later, as I started to explore agriculture much more, three things is I realized, especially my region in the Himalaya, it's the women who do the farming. And most places, it is women who do the farming on small scale, in, in small farms. I did a book for the United Nations. I was asked exactly the question you've asked. And when I looked at the data, it was unbelievable. Most farmers of the world are women. Most farmers of India are women. And not only is it the beginning of agriculture that they shaped, they have continued to be the providers of food while wars have carried on, that little patch of a garden, you know, they've got food on the table one way or the other. And that's why over time, I, you know, my work with women farmers has intensified a lot. First, because they realize how important it is. Second, they realize the value of diversity because they're looking at nature's needs and people's needs. Whereas the men, are always looking at the market. I remember when I started the actual seed saving, going village to village, five years, I did it all alone, walking to villages. And I'd go to the village, I asked the men sitting and playing cards, smoking outside in the tea shop. And I say, do you have these seeds? Because I carry my parents' book. Do you have these seeds? Do you have it? No, 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 who, who grows those primitive things now? Uh, we grow soya to sell and potatoes to sell. But I'd still go to the village and the women would be in the field or in the kitchens or in the garden. And I said, do you have this? Said, of course we do. How would we <laughs> eat? How would our children eat? You know? And uh, they're just looking at the market. We are growing the food. We are taking care of the family. We are doing the real production. And during COVID, one of the programs that evolved very naturally was we, you know, women had created seed banks anyway. And now during COVID, they could supply others in a large way. They could supply vegetables when all transport had shut down. And those green commercial crops could neither buy nor sell. And then we said, let's try and learn from the elder women. All the different foods, not only the cultivate, but all the wild foods, the uh, wild edibles. Because we've already, we haven't always cultivated our food. We've gathered. We are foragers. We are gatherers. And amazing list of 800 edible plants in this place and 500 edible plants in the wild in this place. Of course, you couldn't be spraying Roundup if you want to have all of that diversity. So not only are women the workers in agriculture, in processing, in transport, very often in the distribution, but they are also the holders of the knowledge as participants because they've never seen themselves as separate from nature. So today, if we want the knowledge of biodiversity, we want the knowledge of biodiversity of food, we want awareness of nutrition, it has to come from the women for society. I, I think that that fundamental connection, intimate connection with life itself uh, is what mm -hmm. we need to inject more into the whole, maybe the next revolution that women will lead will be the sustainability revolution, right? I'm sure <laughs> you'll go along with that. <laughs> so I, I wanted to return for a minute to the issue of the G, uh, GMOs and world trade. You've been obviously very outspoken about the issue of biotechnology, the corporate dominance and GMOs. Uh, these are not always properly well understood, the mechanics of this. So let's return to it a little more about that whole idea or corrupt idea 
of owning genetic material and exploiting it that way. I mentioned the meeting of 1987, where the corporations first mentioned owning life. At that time, they were not using the term biotechnology. They were, use, uh, they were using the term GMOs in a very you know, straightforward way, genetic engineering. And they, they are the ones who brought to me the knowledge that they were working on international treaties to force this owning. I then started to follow all three things, the whole issue of biodiversity itself, uh, what's happening in the world of genetic engineering and patenting, and in the area of trade. And then I realized when the East India Company was created, they start, what they started to rule through were free trade agreements, you know, 1711 or 1716. They wrote a free trade agreement. And that's how they took over the trade of India. But even today, the free trade agreements are all takeover. You know, they're asymmetric. They're written by the corporations for corporate takeover. In this particular case, I think all of colonizing urges have been based on bringing a civilizing mission and saying, you are primitive, you know, mm -hmm. taking humanity in its diversity and saying, no, 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 we're not one humanity. We're not one Earth family. Uh, we are the civilized and you have to be civilized. Earlier, it was religion. The civilizing mission was religion. Uh, today, the religion has become a very narrow definition of technology. I mean, I love Buckminster Fuller talking about nature has her own technologies and compared to her technologies. Our technologies are very crude. And of course, I see that every day, take photosynthesis, take soil fertility. Mm. I mean, the amazing work of cooperation and complexity and synergy and symbiosis that works to perfect balance. So uh, I continue to look at that. And, uh, you know, I, I might have been trained in quantum theory, but it was always very helpful. <laughs> and uh, and by saving seeds itself, you know, when they say, oh, only genetic engineering can give you salt tolerance. You know, we lay out all the salt tolerance seeds that farmers had already bred, or the flood tolerance seeds. The... As I mentioned, the corporations that talked about five, now they're four, controlling all agrochemicals and all of seed. So 60% of the commercial seed supply. By the time the Earth Summit was being negotiated and the Biodiversity Convention and the Climate Treaty were being negotiated, my government was had asked me to help them. And I, I remember this, it comes to my mind now, when the minister called me and said, uh, you talk a lot about biodiversity and uh, the biodiversity negotiations are taking place, will you help her? I said, who are you sending as the head of the negotiating team? He said, Project Tiger. Mm -hmm. I said, this is not about tigers anymore. It's about microbes. It's about seeds. Yeah. Uh, so I started to brief governments on what's happening with the world of genetic engineering and biotechnology. And the word biotechnology was picked at the, you know, I remember the UN negotiations, the corporations would get up and say, but you know, biotechnology is how we make cheese and yogurt. I said, no, <laughs> that is a very different biotechnology. Cheese and yogurt, you don't have to mutilate a living organism and add elements that don't belong there without understanding what will it do. And worse, Show me a grandmother who says, my invention, no one else can make rogue yogurt without paying me a royalty. Uh, I said, you know, this uh, whole ownership idea, when you've not created the seed, the, for me, the ontological outrage and the ethical outrage was very, very deep. Um, so I've dedicated my life to these issues. I'm very happy that for India, at least, we managed to write legal law, uh, systems. Uh, strong biosafety systems outside illegally bringing in the GM cotton in 98 and I sued Monsanto and they were mad and I had all kinds of threats but for a while they couldn't sell uh, but because I sued Monsanto and I sued the government Monsanto for doing something illegal because we have laws of biosafety and the government was sleeping 
for, because I said there are laws for bio safety. How come you were sleeping and let these guys come in? Um, but that activated our bio safety system. And since that time, there is no GMO in India. They tried the eggplant. The public hearings were organized first time in the world public hearings for the rights of the eggplant, and it it was banned. And right now, for about five years, they've been trying to push a GM mustard. Uh, we've done say we've saved the seeds. Our farm is full of beautiful mustard diversity right now, but uh, if the issues are up in the Supreme Court, so we built movements. We've done illegal action. We worked with government. Most importantly, we built the alternative. Because I realized that if you have even one seed and one farmer has one seed, that seed can multiply. So this urge to monopolize already fails. Even with one seed, you've destroyed the monopoly. And I, I think that there's obviously another element there, and that is introducing something into the genetic code material that doesn't belong there, as you mentioned, yeah. uh, without really always understanding the long-term consequences on the organism itself. I wonder, do you, do, you, do you see vaccinations in the same way? Well, I haven't looked at the field, but I, I think if the vaccine, vaccines are GMO or mRNA, it needs to be looked at. It yeah. definitely needs to be looked at. Because not only are you adding something that doesn't belong to the organism, because organisms have this self-organizing power, you know, and that constantly the whole system is at work, you know, uh, not the gene and not the master molecule. When you add an element without knowing what it's doing, that's bad enough. But because you now want to claim perfection, improvement, and you want to claim ownership, you actually start, this is the beginning of the total distortion of science, where every powerful independent scientist who was asked by governments to work on, please look at what this GMO is doing, each of them was hounded. Yeah. I was hounded, but Eric Seralini was hounded. Well, Arpad Putsai was hounded. Any sci independent scientist, in the case of Parpat Putsai, he was asked by the UK government and he was given $35 million to look at the GM potatoes. And he had no, you know, he, he was there as a scientist looking at lectures. He didn't expect to find what happened to the rats and their intestines. And when he saw the results, he went to his director and said, this is serious, this is three months of study. If humans eat this all their lives, what's going to happen? Let's just put our results out. And for one day, BBC, Guardian, New York Times, everyone covered it. And then the hit came it, from what we heard. Monsanto called Clinton. Clinton called Blair and said, shut that up. <laughs> the lab was shut down. A gag order was put. We had to have a movement to remove the gag order. Uh, but science that people should have been reading, you know, and knowing when they make their choices about what are they eating, people were denied science. And the more science was crushed, the more said they, they said, trust the science. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned uh, democracy earlier. And so plurality and diversity are at the heart of democracy. And democracy seems to be under attack in many parts of the world now. Uh, in your book, the, the oneness versus the one percent, you explore how control by the few, corporations or individuals, tends to subvert democracy. Uh, can you elaborate on this a little? So, of course, you know, India, having been ruled by the East India Company, we knew what corporate rule can be like. And every instrument of colonialism was evolved through corporate rule. Private property basically commercial trade as economy. Because real economy is what you produce and co-produce with nature. Mm. But what the corporation did was get together to trade, to profit from others' production and reduce their value to nothing. 
So India used to be 25% of the world economy and we were reduced to 2% because the extraction is what transferred so much money and made the corporation at that time, the East India Company. So when I started studied the GAT, I realized it was the corporations again, Monsanto writing the rules of intellectual property, Cargill writing the rules of agriculture trade, uh, the junk food industry, Coke, Pepsi, Nestle, writing the rules of sanitary and phytosanitary measures. And, uh, and then we got together, some of us, we said, if we don't have a forum to tell the story for the people, uh, you know, it'll all be every, you know, all, all boats, when the sea rises, ocean rises, all boats rise, you know, strange phrases like that. And we created the International Forum on Globalization. And together we shut down the World Trade Organization in Seattle. And that was kind of the peak of organizing at the international level. That's when I started to look at the whole issue of global corporations and the erosion of democracy. I wrote my book, Earth Democracy, at that time. Because you know, the media would always say, oh, you people know what you're against. You don't know what you're for. We said, we know what we're against because we know what we're for. I'm against patterning of seed. Because for me, the evolutionary freedom of life and its potential is foundational. We're against privatizing water because water is a common good. And so I wrote Earth Democracy, but I also wrote it with the view of what had been happening. And the three things that came to me was, on the one hand, these corporate rules siphon off the wealth of the society that society is creating and that nature is creating increasingly in the hands of corporations. And those corporations and people who are heading those corporations then end up becoming the 1%. You know, the new billionaires are an example, but it's a result of the rules of globalization. The second thing that's happening is to have this level of concentration because all societies have had laws of equalization. Yeah, there should not be brutal inequality. After all, the Great Depression was there as an example. The age of the robber barons was there as an example. How can we let the robber barons rule again? And all the instruments that used in that time are relevant today, but they are being dismantled. Globalization is deregulation, dismantling of environmental laws, workers' rights, uh, rights of farmers. You just look at everything society put in place for the rights of people and rights of nature is being dismantled. So democracy starts to get eroded. And, you know, there's a, a vote is given, but the vote is in, in increasingly influenced by the same 1%, Citizen United. So you maybe know? that taking this well, further, maybe you can elaborate a little bit the, the, your view about the right of nature movement the personhood, the declaring all life, water, soil, rivers, plants, are all living creatures uh, as legal entities. Well, you know, I've been part of the movement for the rights of nature. Uh, it, uh, uh, the contemporary version was started when the Copenhagen summit was subverted and even more or less got up and said, we were here to protect the rights of Mother Earth, not the polluters. And you are protecting the rights of polluters outside. Outside, five countries dismantle the legal obligations of legally binding commitments. And so then the Rights of Mother Earth Declaration was drafted, the process, and we were part of that group. There are two ways we can take this forward. One is understand that nature as a whole, the earth as a whole, every organism in the earth, is a self-organized living entity with intrinsic worth. And respecting that autonomy and self-organization has to be the basis of our relationship with all beings. And that to me is where the legal issue begins. It would be a mistake to take colonial, patriarchal, anthropocentric legal frameworks 
and try and drag a river into it or drag a mountain, which was attempted, for example, in India. You know, one person would file a case in the court and say, declare the Himalaya mount a living entity. Of course, it's a living entity. Um, but then when they do it in an anthropocentric way or patriarchal way, then what do the courts do? The lower courts appoint an, a man to be the parents' patriarchal. It's the same law that was used for Bhopal. Mm -hmm. That the state becomes the parent. You can't become the parent of Mother Earth. So we've got to decolonize our legal thinking in order to push the rights of nature and rights of Mother Earth to its full maturity. So I, I think we'll need to turn over to some questions, but I have one more one more uh, thing before we end. So it, it looks like humanity yeah. seems to be on a critical evolutionary crossroad. Uh, we need to build something different. Uh, the, the, uh, we need to kind of sit in another future. Uh, so how do you see the alternative that is What is the challenge that we need to face and how to go about it? I think the first challenge is we definitely need a change in paradigm. You, you will not be able to reach sustainability in a mechanistic worldview. You will not be able to reach sustainability in an extractive worldview. And you will definitely not be able to reach sustainability in an hierarchical worldview that takes the most evolved cultures that live in peace with Mother Earth and have lived for thousands of years without harming. You know, when Captain Cook arrives in Australia, the reason he felt he could take over that continent is because he found no sign of destruction. And people like him thought destruction was inevitable for human presence. And that therefore the tribe, the Aboriginal people were not fully human. And that's distortion, that we are not part of the earth, that we have to leave traces of destructiveness yeah. as humanity, as superiority, as anthropocentric arrogance, uh, that we have to shed. But that also means we have to change our views. In the climate debate, I see this so often. We've got to continue to do this and continue to do that and continue to do this because civilization will be hurt if we don't, don't. No. What gives you the arrogance that you were civilized and we were not? Learn from the third world. Learn from the Aboriginal people. Learn from Indigenous people. Learn from women how to tread lightly on this earth. Yes, Vandana, again, wonderful to have had you, and we appreciate the time that you took to be with us, uh, sharing your wisdom and your experience and everything. Again, I'm sorry that it, uh, it's on the screen rather than in person. That would have been even more wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Vandana, again, and uh, bless you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.